And then we'll move on to the next talk, which is also on remote. So Alex, uh, go ahead and share your screen, please. Hopefully you can do it because we, okay, great. Yeah, so go ahead. I'll try to make a noise or do something so you can hear that you've got less than five minutes. Please go ahead. Perfect, uh, thank you. Um, so I'm Alex Levy. Uh, I'm a last year PhD student at the University of Toronto. And today I would like to talk about uh, applications of physics and form neural networks to cosmology. So this talk will be in two parts. The first part, I'll motivate a bit of the research that I do and uh, explain a problem that I've encountered in my work. And the second part will be addressing how neural network provided an elegant solution to that problem. So what I've been mostly focusing on uh, is ultralight axions. So ultralight axions are uh, well-motivated dark matter candidates, a bit like a QCD axion, uh, but of much lower masses. Uh, we're talking uh, masses of about 10 to the negative 21 EV and below. Uh, so they don't form in the, the QCD sense. They will uh, emerge naturally in string theory where they form in a spectrum of masses. So more than one axion species. And because of this, ultralight axions may compose only a part of the dark matter. Uh, and because they are a very, very low mass, if you look on the, on the right-hand side, you can see that the ULAs, the ultralight axions, uh, may escape experimental searches, so we look for them in large-scale structure. Uh, you may be familiar with ultralight bosons as dark matter uh, in the form of fuzzy dark matter. And, uh, but in this case, uh, in the case of ultralight axions, we don't impose that the, the ultralight particles compose the totality of the dark matter. We calculate their relic density from high-energy physics, uh, and then they can compose just a subcomponent. So the model that we look at, uh, simply instead of adding uh, a ton of parameters to lambda CDM for all of the axion species, uh, what we do is that we look for minimal deviations from lambda CDM. So we start with uh, lambda CDM and we add two parameters. The first one is the mass of the ultralight field or the ultralight axions. And the, the second parameter is the fraction of the dark matter composed of these ultralight axions. So this is gonna be between zero and one. Uh, as we tend towards zero, we just recover lambda CDM. And as we tend to a fraction of one, we get back fuzzy dark matter. Both uh, scenarios have been well studied. So this is the, the motivation from uh, particle or high energy physics, uh, but there's also some motivation from cosmology. So if you look at this paper from Blum and Teodori, uh, by studying the uh, H0 tension from gravitational lensing, they found that having an ultralight axion of mass 10 to the negative 25 EV, uh, composing 10% of the dark matter, alleviated that lensing tension by the formation of cores in, uh, in the lensing galaxies. And so if we want to study the, the behavior of these ultralight axions, because they're, they're the Broglie wavelength, is much, much larger than the interparticle separation. They are described by, wave by a wave function, uh, where the wave function, the, the modulus of the wave function squared is simply the density, and the evolution of the wave function is given by the Schrodinger equation. The potential, in this case, is simply the gravitational potential. And so these two equations together form the Schrodinger Poisson system. We note here that the cold dark matter will couple to the axions uh, through the gravitational potential. So both feel the same potential well. So by running simulations involving these two equations together, uh, what we find is that we have a, we, we form halos that are slightly fuzzier than, uh, than usual halos in the, uh, in the pure CDM case. This is a simulation code that uh, I'm co-developing with Bodo Schwab at the University of Göttingen. We are about to make this code public, so keep your eyes peeled uh, for the archive for that. Okay, so extracting the density profile of our halo, uh, we can see that our density profile, like our dark matter, will have two components, so one axions and one for cold dark matter. And the goal in my research, what I've been trying to do, is to infer the axion mass from a measurement of the density. So uh, can I use some observation of lensing or rotation curves and measure the mass of the dark matter, even if it is a subcomponent. 
and there are two approaches to do this. Uh, the first one would be to full solve the what we call the, the forward problem, like running simulations uh, and running simulations for a wide range of parameters until I get some scaling relation uh, and using these scaling relations to get the mass. This is unfortunately extremely expensive because the hydrodynamical simulations of the Schrodinger equation are, are really expensive. So what we would like to do instead is to solve the inverse problem. Start with the data, specify the PD describing this data, and then infer the parameters from uh, those two things. And this is what we call the inverse problem in mathematics. So in order to solve the inverse problem, we're going to simplify the system a bit. Uh, and so by assuming spherical symmetry in a uh, time independent density, we can use this ansatz on the first line, which is a uh, time independent density, so modulus squared with a time dependent phase. Plotting that back in and assuming spherical symmetry, we get these two equations describing the equilibrium solution of the Schrodinger Poisson system. And what you'll notice is that we have an equation relating the potential, the density, and the mass together along with an eigenvalue gamma, which for us is not of interest. And so solving the inverse problem uh, is then isolating these terms from the equation given the data. So what an inverse problem is really uh, is just an optimization problem. So if you start with an initial guess for the mass and uh, the eigenvalue gamma, uh, then given your density and potential, we can try to minimize the root mean squared error between the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the equation. In the perfect case, when these two sides are equal, this error is simply zero. Uh, but if you have some noise in your data, then you can find the, the minimum, uh, the least objectionable uh, values. In this case, it would just be the, the, the values of M and gamma, which minimize this error function. And this is where the neural network come in. We can plot our function, uh, our error function, as a surface in parameter space. And in this case, what we want to do is to use the physics informed neural network to perform a gradient descent operation on the surface to find the points uh, m and gamma, which minimize the error. This is where the physics informed in physics informed neural network comes in, uh, because in this case, oh, you, because in this case, uh, the, the cost function or the loss function of the neural network is defined by the physics equation describing our system. So this is how the neural network knows about the physics of the system. And what you can see is that the neural network will start with an initial guess of M and gamma and then use this gradient descent operation to find uh, the point at which the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the equation match and thus inverting the system and giving us the, the axion mass from the data. Of course, this isn't a perfect case, right? I, I've taken the density profile from the simulation and I assume that the, the density profile is known perfectly, but in reality, that's not exactly what, how it would happen. And so to validate this, uh, this method, I generated some uh, simulated rotation curve. So from the, the simulation, I extracted a density profile and then by integrating the density profile, I get the enclosed mass, and I get the circular velocity by V squared is GM over R. Uh, by adding some noise, then I make a realistic uh, rotation curve and try to see, can I then use standard statistical methods to find the mass from the rotation curve? And so I start by fitting the rotation curve and start solving the inverse problem. Uh, then using a simple MCMC sampler, uh, in this case it was nested sampling, but the, the method itself is not uh, that relevant. Uh, I get a set of different phi functions and V functions that could fit the data uh, within the error bars. And then for each of these samples, I run the, the physics informed neural network, and then I bin each of the mass that I get every time I run this, this PINF. I will note here that the, PIN, the PINN method is extremely fast. It can be embedded in an MCMC sampler. And from this, I get a posterior distribution on the particle mass. So this time, because there is error in the data, of course, there will be some spread to that distribution. Uh, we know that in the perfect case where the error bars are zero, we get uh, exactly the mass back. And so in short, 
to validate this method, I generated some uh, simulated observations. And for each of the samples, when I fit this simulated observations, I ran the PINN, which runs in an order of a few seconds. And then I was able to extract them as directly from a noisy data. As I'm running low on time, I'll, I'll go out and uh, just summarize some of the conclusions of, of this work. So the first is that solving inverse problem is uh, comparable to parameter estimation in, uh, in cosmology. So we have two different names for a, a very similar procedure. Uh, the, the inverse problem has the advantage that it's often cheaper than solving the forward problem, especially if the forward problem involves running very computationally expensive simulations. Uh, using this neural network, and the, in this case, it was the atom optimizer, allows us to run these, uh, this optimization step very efficiently and very accurately to the point where it can be embedded in very fast techniques like uh, Monte Carlo Markov chains. Uh, and it is excellent to finding the, the parameter values, which are uh, the, the best fit parameters. Uh, and then it's easy from uh, finding the, the best fit parameters to then perturb around those points. So just identifying the best fit values uh, is, is, can be done with neural networks just through optimization. So I'd like to thank the, the organizers for inviting me to speak. And I will take your questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there some questions in the room? Must be far away from coffee. <laughs> um, are there any questions on Slack? Uh, yeah, sorry, Mark, go ahead. Yes, yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, Maybe I missed it, but I was wondering, uh, so you, you have an intermediate step before using your neural network in which you get some density profiles. Is there a way of going directly from the rotation curve to the mass estimates? Um, to estimate certainly. the posterior distribution directly from the rotation curve? Maybe it's a silly question, just one. Uh, no, not at all. Um, Yes, but then the equation that I would feed into my uh, PINN would be different. It would be the equation describing the velocity. So I would have an integration over phi. So it would be an integral differential equation in that case. Uh, but PINNs have been shown to be able to solve that kind of problem. So yes, it would be possible to combine the two steps. Thank you. So And, and so then what's the advantage of going through this intermediate step? Sorry. Uh, solving the differential equation, I think, is uh, slightly faster than running the integral differential equation. Because the minimization procedure, if you have an integral, means that you have to need, you, you need to set up some weights uh, to perform the integral. And so those are added as free parameters in your system. So having a differential equation is usually slightly faster. I see. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Um, if not, then let's go. Thank you very much again, Alex. Uh, please. Uh, yeah.